Go ye therefore, said Jesus, and make disciples of all nations. So as a disciple of Jesus, how does the Bible describe you? What do you do, and what shall we be teaching you? We're talking about discipleship. I'm making an invitation to you to worship with us every Sunday with your choice of 8.30 and 10.30. You can come in person at 400 North Swinton at the corner of Lake Ida and Swinton. Or you can come online and watch and participate on any device that tunes in trinitydelray.org. I'm inviting you to our Bible study right now, right now. And let's talk about discipleship. What does the Bible say about becoming disciples of Jesus? When we become a disciple of Jesus, it helps us to survive the things that come upon us because of changes in our lives and changes in the culture and changes when our lives intersect with that culture. Discipleship, being firm and knowledgeable in your faith and knowing Jesus Christ as Savior, the one who teaches us all about his sacrifice and his death for the forgiveness of our sins. So we're talking about discipleship in the New Testament right now. And the word disciple is used for someone who follows Jesus, who is attached to or follows someone. There were disciples of Jesus, as we know, but some of Paul's followers were called his disciples. John the Baptist, you will remember, had disciples that he had to turn over to Jesus. A disciple in the New Testament is someone who is one of the disciples of Jesus or is a believer. And that's how the gospel writer, the evangelist Luke uses the word. So that's just a brief review of what we covered last time. And I want you to note that uh, in the gospel accounts of calling the disciples, it's always Jesus that takes the initiative. Jesus takes the initiative. Okay. Now here are the number of people who are in our Bible study. And uh, I don't know why we don't have, there we are. There you are. Welcome back. <laughs> Discipleship in the New Testament. There is a distinction. Not all disciples are apostles. I think you knew that. All the apostles were disciples. Those designated as the twelve, and it's sometimes the eleven, were distinguished from the other disciples. So if you draw a large circle in your mind or on a sheet of paper, in that large circle, put the word disciples. So that circle is the collection, the set of all people who are followers of Jesus called disciples. Now in that large circle, put a smaller circle. It's actually a much, much smaller smaller circle, and in that small circle, you can put the word apostles. You see the idea that all the apostles were part of that large group called disciples, but not all the disciples were called apostles. I think that helps us read the Gospels in the Bible when we see that distinction. The disciples do and are certain things. They're described. They are servants because they serve. They are sent. They report back to Jesus Christ about what they found on their missionary journeys. And they teach others and make disciples of others. And they love. Let's take those one at a time. And I'm asking you, Judy, to begin reading. 
The call to discipleship includes service. And here is the Bible verse. Luke 22, 26. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become... become um, I can't see all my words. As the youngest. Beca become huh? as the youngest and the leader... Uh, the leader as one who serves who serves okay yeah the pictures our pictures are blocking my screen on the right yeah if i could move those uh, does that help did, did uh, they move i don't know i'm i don't know if i can make mine move there okay what is that is that better okay so let's go on to the fact that disciples are sent by jesus Who's going to read Luke 10, 2? Chris? 10, 1. Is Chris there? Christine? I'm here. I, I just I was muted. Um, after, the, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. I didn't know. Thank you. He sent them. Did you know there are missionary journeys right there in the middle of the gospel? They prepared the way for him. The third thing, the disciples come back from that missionary journey when they prepared the way for him, and they report. What did they report? Who will read, please? Luke ten seventeen. The 72, I can hardly read it. It's very opaque. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't read it clearly. I'm sorry. I, 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 yeah. I would clear it up if I could. 22 natural. The 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the um, demons are subject to us in your name. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Okay. They reported. And fourth, the disciples teach. What did Jesus say in Matthew 28, 20? I don't know who else is here, but I'll say it. Matthew 28, 20. Go therefore and make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Teaching them. Yeah. Jesus taught. You can look up the number of times that he taught the disciples and others in the crowds. And there were commands and there were promises. And his intention is that until he comes again, the church has been busy doing this, teaching those who are followers to gather together and to scatter and go on teaching what he had taught them. It is like making a copy over and over and over again, a copy of Jesus' teaching going out into all the world. It sometimes seems like, it seems like we'll never be done with that. In Matthew 28, 24, 14, this is recorded that the gospel will be preached to the whole world and then the end will come. Mm -hmm. You know, Pastor, um, because children are born every day, it is our job to teach them. I, I personally am not a witness to that because I did not have children. However, that is the process. The same with the Bible or teaching the Bible. You have to teach them how to be grown people. That's right, Chris, and every time that you support the church of which you are a member, you are doing some teaching through those who have been called to teach in our schools and in our Sunday schools and in other classrooms where children and uh, even teenagers are continuing to learn. They may not be your children biologically, but they are my children and they are your children. I want you to take heart in that. Uh, the church cannot do this. It, one person cannot do all of this. We have to gather together in many ways and continue to in, 
invent and innovate and teach using things like Zoom. <laughs> I think, I think too many times when parents have their children baptized um, and one accepts to be a, a sponsor does not realize how important that job is as a sponsor, um, that they're asked to uh, help teach and bring that child up in the Lord. And the congregation also makes a commitment at that baptism. That's right. And you and I gather to help keep that commitment. Correct. Thank you for mentioning that. If you had a record of all the people you sponsored that you were a godparent to, it's a big, it's a big thing to remind the parents and the children mm -hmm. what they have been taught. Let's go back to this. Discipleship in the New Testament. There's one inescapable sign of a disciple, and that is love. What did Jesus say? John 13, 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Ooh. That's, wow. That's how they know. That's how they know. And there are every day many opportunities to, to love. <laughs> Met a man yesterday on the corner who knew my neighbor and uh, later, my neighbor said, I'm still working on him. And I know what he meant. <laughs> well, uh, we had a couple of things in common. So I have kind of a holy intent to make a contact. And then the man who tended my house is in touch with me. And I said, you know, this man is looking for a company like yours to tent his house. And we went on and talked. And he said, Give him my card. <laughs> now I have an excuse to go to his door and say, say, I told you about this company that did a good job for, uh, for us. Uh, I want you to call my friend here and uh, uh, he'll take care of you. Mention my name. So <laughs> I got my foot in the door. We'll see what happens. Thank you, Lord, for a wonderful day filled with chances to witness to our faith. Uh, and my neighbor reported that his sister is making some better signs of, of life, of having been in a coma, <clears throat> now responding uh, in small ways. In order to make disciples, Jesus commands us to teach. And I think that's the core of what I'm talking about in this session today. Go and make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to observe. That word observe means to keep, to obey, not only to know, but to know to do and to have God's help in doing all that you do with him and for him. So uh, to, to observe is, is a lot more than just looking at it. It means to keep. All right. Discipleship in the New Testament teaching. Now there's two questions about that teaching. Two questions. The first is, what does it mean to teach? Have you ever thought about that? How many of you have ever been a teacher in one way or another, Sunday school or um, in, in the church or in the school? Bobby has, of course, for 30, 30 some years. Yes. What does it mean to teach, Bobby? You're the best one to answer that. <laughs> Right. Uh, it's to sometimes facilitate information that's out there for, for our students, um, show them the way, give them the opportunity to, to learn and grow themselves. You All know, right. and, and you're giving us an opportunity to learn and grow in, in our Bible study here. That's right. What does it mean to teach? Somebody else want to talk about that, if you've ever taught. Pastor, I, I had to teach one time as a graduate teaching assistant, and um, I find it, I, it was so hard that I think I never wanted to be a teacher because uh -huh. I was worried from the beginning to the end, and it was a whole semester. I think it was two semesters, actually, but it was like, wow, this is hard. And it was nutrition that <laughs> I loved, but it was very hard. And maybe I wasn't ready for it. I think that's probably what the course was. Why is teaching hard? I'll ask all of you. 
Well, because you can't guarantee, um, I guess that the person is going to receive it the way you want them to receive it. All right, you have set up um, uh, two squares. In one square is the teacher and, and the other square is uh, the learner or uh -huh. disciple. And there's an arrow going from the teacher to the disciple. Correct. There's an arrow coming back from the learner to the teacher. And that backwards arrow is saying, did you get what I was transmitting? Correct. So teaching is a two-way process. Some teachers forget that. It's questions, a lot of questions and answers many times. Right. A good teacher asks good questions. Questions that stimulate the mind. As when your third or fourth grade teacher said, I have a difficult question for you now, put on your thinking caps. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was kind of a concentration exercise. Listen to the words I'm saying and think about them deeply. Teaching is, uh, is a fantastic thing and I have enjoyed almost all of my life. Uh, we would gather the day before, the night before our chemistry exam in high school, and uh, five or six other students would ask me to explain what they didn't understand. Mm. I, I was an eleventh grader, and I was I was teaching, and I found out that. I found some joy in doing that. Wow. And later on, I, I was asked to teach uh, Sunday school. And, um, oh, that was a scary thing, like you said. <laughs> this is important <laughs> material. And it was a joy, though. And then the pastor said, I want you to teach the adults. And, I, oh, wow, you know, we're teaching Galatians up in the balcony of the old church. And I was having so much fun. And you see, uh, it was given to me. That was a gift that God gave me to, to have the joy of teaching. But what does it mean to teach? Mm. The verb. Well, to share. To share, good. What else? Duplicate. To duplicate what you know in the mind and heart of others. I said heart because I really mean that information in the head. Well, we could talk about that all day. Yeah. And then the second question is, what shall we teach? Mm -hmm. And that gets defined for us in the word discipleship. All right. Now, I want to tell you the teaching is more than talk. I could take a book and put it in a computer and I could cause that computer to talk even in nice sounding voices, not computer talk, but, but just nice human speech. So I could just play that. I would play the book and the mm. book would talk. That's not teaching. Mm -hmm. No, teaching is more than talk. Teaching is more than imparting knowledge. And a lot of teachers stop at this place. Hmm. Well, they could read the book on themselves. Teaching is explaining and applying. And it includes feedback, that backwards arrow I talked about. Okay. Most teachers in school, at least Bobby, they used to, they find out if they did a good job by, by testing. And there's many ways to test, but they find out, did what I transmitted to the students get copied accurately? And now that's a two-way street. And 100% uh, of, uh, of the burden is on both teacher and student. This, the, the, the teacher cannot have 100% responsibility and then the students uh, be passive and just soak it up. There is an effort 
on the part of the student, and if the student doesn't do the effort, there is no teaching going on. Boy, books have been written. Uh, the psychology of teaching is filled with literature on this idea of, did you get the message accurately? Do you understand it? Do you know what it means in the life that you are living and going to live? If you add and subtract accurately, can you apply that to the balancing of your checkbook? Well, let's try it. And then they have an exercise. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. It's why it takes 12, 14, uh, 18 years and more. A teaching includes application. Information without application, well, that's just what we can do in a computer. Yeah. A computer does not have the ability so far, um, artificial intelligence is working on it, to apply what the machine learns. I think that's where that's where it comes in, where your action and how you how you apply it with um, passion. I think when somebody has passion, a teacher has passion about a subject and excitement and enthusiasm, and shows that in their actions, that excites a student and uh, helps. Uh, you know, that's all part of the love they have for the subject. They're showing it through those actions and feelings. Thank you. You must love the student and the, and the material. Mm -hmm. If you love the material, not the student, you kind of go part of the way. If you love the student, but don't have a, a, a grasp of the material, well, they struggle to, to take in what you have. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of joy in it too. When you apply it and see changes in people's lives, if those of you who have done even what you're talking about, Chris, uh, applying what you know in nutrition to others, I can just about guarantee you that some of what you said is still with them today, though they may not be aware where they've got it. <laughs> well, I, I was talking about a young person in front of a of an audience of like a couple hundred. That scared the willies out of me. But as teaching as a dietitian one on one in the hospital, I thought I broke things down and, and did a better job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, small groups are much easier. Yeah. Now, there are two things in teaching. Um, you, if you say, but you don't do, they, you lose credibility. Say and you go together, talk and act. Mm -hmm. The precept and the example. Jesus is the perfect example of one who did what he said. He loved. He didn't just say you ought to love one another. And that, that's, a, that's a book length article right there. So what shall we teach? That's the second question. The second question. Uh, What shall we teach? Now, I'm talking about discipleship in the New Testament, right? Not right. geography or physics, or chemistry, or nutrition. I'm not talking about advanced calculus. We're talking about what we believe and what we believe comes from what source? What is the content of our teaching? Jesus Christ. That's right. And what is the source of our teaching? The Bible, the Word. Right. Bible, Word, Scriptures, we could talk about how those words differ, but right now we're just talking about that book that's sitting there, and it's, yep. it's inanimate. It can't do anything unless it enters the eyes, the mind, and the heart. Right. So it's the job of the teacher to bring what is has been written beginning with Genesis 1 verse 1 ending with the last verse in the book of Revelation even so come quickly Lord Jesus okay what shall we teach what parts what kind of summary can we give? It's really a huge amount of information, relationships. I think it goes back to where you said, you know, 
teach it with love. I think if we can start with love, many people do not even know what love is all about, agape love, and uh, and how you know Jesus, how we love the scripture, our our love for Jesus Christ, and why we love Him, and then and then showing it through some of our actions. Many times, actions like you said, going to your neighbor. And just getting to know them or sharing that, you know, you've got a good business that uh, they can work with. It's those types of kindnesses that um, get your foot in the door. That's right. Yes. And if I get a chance to do the premarital counseling for the couple that wants to be married, yes. the waitress and, and her husband to be, well, that would be a source of teaching because the gospel is That's always true. part of premarital counseling yes love pastor i have a friend um who wanted uh needed to get her hair cut it, it, i've known this woman for uh, 12 13 years and and her her she just wants to bring people to christ and so this happened i mean and and i can't say she's been successful but this happened so innocently two weeks ago she went to get her hair done on a sunday and a different girl was there. And not only did she get that girl in the sense of she was ready, and the girl has is has brought people together and they're gonna have a small Bible class in the beauty salon on a day where people aren't there. <laughs> fantastic. Yes, it is really fantastic for her too. She's in her element. She's so good at that. That's uh, That is a good story. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yes. So let's get a brief outline of the content of our teaching. And this next slide is just going to go whoomp on you, okay? <laughs> because the content of our teaching, when we draw from the scriptures, the many teachings that are in there by, uh, by subject, take a look at this brief outline. Oh, my God. <laughs> There are 25 items there, I think, I counted. And uh, you don't have to take them in this order. Revelation and Scripture, that's where I would start. In Law and Gospel, the Triune God, Creation, Humanity, Sin, the Grace mm -hmm. of God, the Person of Christ, the Work of Christ. Now, look at this. The Person of Christ, the Work of Christ. Do you recall those two items? Oops. Person of Christ, the work of Christ. Do you recall those from anything recently that you've seen here on this kind of a screen? Didn't we have several weeks here in this Zoom Bible class? Of who is Christ? The person and work of Christ? Right. Who is Christ? Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Right. right. And, and, and didn't we talk about prayer for many weeks? Yes. Yes. Do you see what I have been doing? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> about four or five years ago, I we had... Uh, a class called what is a pastor and what is he doing here what is he doing, huh? remember that that was the title what is a pastor and what is he doing here that was uh, uh, several lessons on the ministry right. <laughs> and I had to be away for a few weeks or it was a vacation I guess and I handed to someone a brief study uh, two or three pages on the church so let's let's check these off. <laughs> yeah. Do you Boy. see what I'm, do you see what I'm doing? There's a few. You're going through the list that you made of what you should teach. It's, right. It comes or what we all should teach, but well, I what, am, what you should teach from. now let the cat out of the bag. What's he doing in the bag? Uh, <laughs> he wouldn't go in there. Listen, uh, lift off the veil. Um, Without any apologies or explanations, my my work I'm called to do is to teach. Okay, so what I've been doing is I've been discipling you. Yes. For mm -hmm. ten, almost eleven years. 
Oh my God, is it that long? Yeah, I'm sorry. It it, it must seem longer. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, really, no, no, none of that stuff. What we're talking about is that when we draw from the Bible all the Bible bas passages about baptism and we teach what is baptism and what does it profit, I'm doing catechism. When I am applying it to our lives, how uh, we are buried with Christ, uh, Romans chapter 6, and, and the Lord's Supper, I'm looking at something on that. I have something about the, the person and work of Christ that was left undone, and that's sitting in my basket over here. I'm, I've got a lot to do, so I, I hope that you're ready for the, the trip. I don't want to overwhelm you with this. No, 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 we just take a little bit at a time. You don't eat the whole three-pound salami in one bite. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Did you ever hear of the salami method of breaking down a large, terrible, difficult job uh, that you just don't want to even uh, approach? Someone told me many, many years ago about the salami method. What you do is you take a small, thin, eighth-inch slice of that salami and enjoy that. I hope you like salami. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you just don't eat the whole three pounds at once. <laughs> it's, it's, it, no, it would make you sick. I was going to say, it might make you turn away from the subject. <laughs> you could never have a, yeah. So that's right. And so we take little thin slices. It is... Um, but see, because you're never done, you don't get overwhelmed by this list. You just do a little bit, a little salami slice. Now I'm going to get off of that before you go run away. <laughs> <laughs> but I have so much joy in doing this. Uh, I can't stop. And by the Lord's grace, uh, he gave me another year. <laughs> you see, this is how yesterday was going. Some definitions about discipleship. I glean these from others. I, uh, I'm not a plagiarist, but I'm not above copying good definitions of disciple. Someone said, someone, a disciple is someone who follows the teachings, the life, and aim of another until the person becomes like the master. Hmm. A disciple has Jesus Christ as the pattern. Mm -hmm. Think about that. You ever make a dress out of a pattern? Yep. Did you I ever... never wanted to wear it after I made it, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, not everyone is a seamstress. <laughs> or a quilt, as Jeannie does with quilting. Yeah. Quilting yeah. patterns. She has great joy in that. And I she's... love quilting. She's become very good at it. A disciple follows the teachings of another until they become a, a pattern. Mm -hmm. In the case of Jesus, we are never a perfect replica of him because of sin. Indeed, said uh, the Apostle Peter, you were called to do this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example the word there is a writing copy so that you would follow in his steps. In his steps. Mm -hmm. If you were a child in first grade learning, okay, now it's kindergarten, you're learning to print your letters on the sheet of paper from the workbook that everybody has, there are dotted lines that are almost an A. And what the student does mm -hmm. is follow the dots and make an A. And then they make another one. And they've got a whole page of A's. Very good. You got the letter A. You see, that was a writing example, something to copy until you got it. You understand what, what the word example here is? Mm -hmm. yep. You're copying Jesus, starting with his love for others. That's what a disciple does. He copies Jesus. She copies Jesus. And it's a lifelong thing. And there are many setbacks and failures and difficulties. And I can't do that. It's hard. It's hard to love someone who's hurt you. It's hard to forgive. I know. 
<laughs> he left you an example so you would follow in his steps. Those are big shoes to follow. Yeah. Here's another definition. A disciple is one who actively, actively mm -hmm. imitates both the life and the teachings of the master. Teaching is singular there, and that's actually more accurate. There is only one teaching, as many parts. You can see how that applies, that we disciple others as we have been discipled by him. We've been imitating him in all the good ways that the word imitation means. Make a copy. Discipleship is teaching while modeling. One of you mentioned that earlier, while modeling and guiding others toward living righteously. A disciple who disciples others without herself doing those same things is not is not a very good writing copy to copy. Yeah. A bad example will ruin the teaching. It'll tear it up. But a good example is attractive. A, a good example. Can you be a good example? Is it hard? It's hard. Sometimes. Why? Some um. I think sometimes we um, we aim for perfection oh. or something we aren't when really the example we are is very adequate to be sharing God's love. I think we sometimes feel inadequate that we can't teach something, especially relating to um, discipling. And we don't give ourselves credit for just being who we are and sharing right. it. Yeah, and, and you have to admit to your own failings when you model, because you are not perfect. And that sometimes is even better, sharing our testimony is what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. I'm, not a, I'm not perfect, but I am a forgiven sinner. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't give me license to sin. No, it explains why I'm not perfect. So instead of pointing to ourselves, we point to him who is our master and teacher. Who is perfect. You know, I, I get this, this feeling right now that I am still teaching principles, but here we have spent uh, four or five, five weeks talking about the word discipleship and what it means mm. in the Bible. And probably most people in the church today, I would say, what? Most people have not studied the word discipleship. Have you? Have you ever uh, studied discipleship? No. Uh, I think this. Is not as a subject, even though you knew it was there. Okay. Probably indirectly with Bible studies. Okay. It was underneath, not not spoken. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say many years ago when I came, I think the old, um, I'm trying to think that 18 month course that we took shared a lot in discipleship. I um, oh, can't think of the name. Uh, Church is Alive program it was that we did 18 months of, uh, and that, and that uh, really formed a close knit group when you made a commitment to 18 months of being together in a Bible study, yes, um, is. which is unheard of right now. Uh, I'm trying to, Church is Alive, uh, but it, it had a special name. I might think of it later on. But there was there was discipleship and there was always, um, uh, part of our class was always um, doing something, putting it, putting what we learned to action in one, mm -hmm. one form or the other, you know, learning to sit down and write a three minute testimony, um, actually doing some little uh, get togethers and inviting people into the Bible study or this sort of thing. So outreaches. Okay, good. Discipleship is living the Christian life as it was meant to be lived. See, this is all example because people notice, people notice. 
discipleship is the road less taken. A mm -hmm. very well-known publication, I think, 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, the road less taken. There are some principles. Discipleship requires your self-discipline. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, where am I? Where am I going to get some of that? <laughs> I I think I've shared this with you before. That this is uh -huh. how do you get self discipline? <laughs> Listen, every day do something that you really didn't want to do, <laughs> because you put a bit and bridle in your own mouth, and you pull back and you say, "Now go." And part of you says, I don't want to. I'm not going to listen to that. We're going. We're doing this. And I know you have done this in your lives because I. <laughs> it's so common. If you never get self-discipline, I think my grandmother was right uh, that she told me I lacked this. I'm still <laughs> looking for it. Self-discipline. It's the last in the nine fruit of the Spirit, that are listed in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The last one is self-control. Huh. I don't know why it's last, but it is difficult at times. Uh, discipleship requires your time. I'll come if I have time. <laughs> That's not going to do it. I need a commitment. You need to make time. And that's what you are doing on Saturday at 10 o'clock. You were doing it on Sundays at 8.30 or 10.30. You were doing it on Sundays at, um, oh, whenever we got started, <laughs> 10 o'clock. <laughs> and uh, you remember. And and you were doing it on Thursday morning or, or Wednesdays, or you were going to a small group Bible study. But you made a commitment to you, to, to put your time in on it. If you don't do that, there's not going to be any discipleship going on. No, no, it's not like a snack. It's like a series of meals. <laughs> you have to digest it. And then you have to go back and review it. Now, I don't want to put that have to in there. Just take all that have to out of it. Have to. You know, Pastor, I, I wanted to talk about time because I look back now 10 or 12, year, uh, 12 years or so. And the time that I've devoted to it has brought me to where I am. And I look at a new person and feel if they have so much to go through, or maybe they're smarter than me and get through it quicker, but it takes a long time, uh, even for someone late in life. Yeah. Um, to invest. absorb it all. You're investing when you yes. give your when you put your time into it. It requires effort. I suppose that goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, self-discipline, time, and, and some effort. I remember uh, Pastor Feinmeyer when uh, was the pastor when we first moved here in 1985, and he had put out a challenge to all the congregational members. He said, besides the one hour you give us, give, give to the Lord on Sunday, he said, I want you to take another hour and give it to Bible study and get involved in a Bible study. Yeah. And uh, he put out a challenge and you know, had a lot of people and then had Bible studies available. Let's keep on doing that. Discipleship is a becoming, a process. It's not a destination. You're never done. You never arrive. You're never complete. Mm. And St. Paul admitted of that. He strived and, and he yes. worked and he labored. And he loved the people that he came upon and taught them. He discipled without any kind of electronic apparatus, without any amplifiers, except his own voice and his, his stylus, his pen. But it is a something that is never complete. And I think we have to recognize this as the outset. Otherwise... We might wonder, well, why are, why am I not done? Uh -huh. No, you're done. The time you enter heaven, and now you know all things, <laughs> and you know Him even as you have been known. 
1 Corinthians 13. So these gleanings from others, disciples involve themselves in God's word. Discipleship expect transformation, change. If you don't want to be changed by the Lord, well, let's forget it. Because his intent is that you be changed to be more like him. Someone else was talking. I'd add here. Self-denial. Deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. And follow him means listen to him and do what he says and take some joy. There's not a whole lot of gospel in this lesson today. I apologize for that, but there is gospel. Every time Jesus is preached, he is the savior of the world and he's my savior too. Amen. He, he has transformed me. <laughs> oh, it's been hard for him. It is the work of the spirit through the word. My wife has been so patient with me. She has been so patient. Light bulb moments. <laughs> it is, yeah, it's just something changes inside and I don't want to, I don't want to be for self. I want to be for another person. Marriage requires transformation. I don't think no, young couples realize that. Uh, I could go into detail. Practice self-denial. Now, and this is the concluding slide uh, today. And I think that it's going to be hard to read. Yes, it's kind of blurry. Is yeah. it? Blurry? It is. Yeah. This is, a, this is a book written in 1936 by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who died at a young oh. age, a pastor in Germany. Um, yeah. He dared to go against the Third Reich to go against Hitler's uh, domination. He okay. spoke against it. And I'll, I'll read it, and you'll get it in the email that I'll send you a little bit later. So you can read this at your leisure, and you can kind of stew the, the cost yeah. of discipleship. Where is that book? Well, I don't have it handy. I, it's one of the first books I ever bought that were theological. I bought it in 1973 or 72. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been, uh, it looks like it's been through the war. But I've uh, got dog-eared pages and it's just a beautiful book. Dietrich Bonhoeffer had his problems, but <clears throat> let me get to the point of this. He's talking about cheap grace and he explains what cheap grace is that um, the grace of god in christ jesus is something that so many people take for granted or don't even take now we quote cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance cheap grace is grace without discipleship Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ. Grace is costly. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it cost a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man or a woman the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace, because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. You were bought with a price. And what has, got, what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. That paragraph has probably been quoted thousands and thousands of times by pastors who wanted to get across. So I'm reading in Jeremiah in chapter 7, I think it was. And Jeremiah is called by the Lord to preach, to preach against sin. And Jeremiah, actually the Lord, is disturbed 
about this thing going around that could have been called back then cheap grace mm -hmm. because he was angry. The, the God was angry at the priest because they were preaching peace, peace when there was no peace. Mm -hmm. The peace on the level we first think about is they were preaching nothing is going to harm you. The enemy will not come. The prophet is wrong. You will be fine. That's what the priests were preaching. Well, of course, that was not true because the enemy was going to come and destroy Jerusalem and take many into captivity in Babylonia. All right, this is about 600 years BC, if I have the date right. Well, that's the first level of peace, peace, where there is no peace. But the real nub of the matter is that the, the priests, and let's call them the pastors, were preaching that God loves you no matter what, and you don't have to worry about anything, and mm -hmm. you don't really have to go about changing your lives. He was allowing, the, the priest was allowing sin and not preaching against sin. That's cheap grace, which is useless. Cheap grace does not require repentance, does not require discipleship, does not require a real Jesus who really died and really bled for the sins of those people in Jeremiah's time and for the sins of all the people on the face of this earth today. This is the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit are, are with us. And that's not going to go away. I want you to think about this repentance. Okay. Where you need changing, not to be a disciple, but just to be one of his. God requires you to change and to stop the things that you know displease him. And when you have trouble with that, to call upon him in prayer. Lord, I'm not doing well. I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. Come to me in, in this hour. Lord God, I, I thank you that you gather people like these seven or eight here and then a couple dozen later to hear what you have to say about following your son, Jesus. And I pray that you will grant us forgiveness of the sin and that you will enlighten our hearts by your Holy Spirit that we may daily want to follow you and, and have joy in doing it and have joy in telling others that we have, we have a God who loves us even though we sin. We have a God who has come to us and we call him Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.